So we're ready to begin. Um, before we begin, I just want to give a quick reminder about the pre-survey link that we have posted on the chat section. Kindly take a look and try to fill that up before the end of the session. So with that said, hello to all wonderful participants joining us from various time zones worldwide. Good day, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Uma Sandal Kumar, in short, go by Uma. I received my MD from St. Matthias University from Cayman Islands, and I completed my postgraduate residency training in family medicine from Eastern Virginia Medical School, United States. So prior to my MD degree, I received a professional doctoral degree in Indian system of medicine. Um, it's a herbal medicine. And now that I have MD in allopathic medicine, I'm able to see the immense value in integrative medicine, combining the best aspects of medicine from all around the world. This encouraged me to pursue a fellowship in integrative medicine, and I was blessed to get an opportunity to do it at the world-renowned Andrew Vale Center for Integrative Medicine in Arizona, United States. After several working years in the United States, now I'm delighted to be a part of a wonderful team at Reem Hospital in Abu Dhabi, UAE, where I serve as a consultant family medicine physician and integrative medicine physician. I always value networking and would love to connect with you all. Please email me or connect with me on LinkedIn, and I will look forward to learning about your stories. So I think that's sufficient enough about my background. Let's move on. Um, I so much wish I, I, I can see you all in one room, such a diverse group of aspiring physicians still joining into the session. I can't hide my excitement about learning the influence of our individual cultural values in leadership. So we are very delighted to have you here with us today. And from Onka Aspire team, a warm welcome to all to this empowering session on physician leadership. Let me start with saying the best physician is the one who can lead with compassion, inspire with knowledge, and heal with both expertise and empathy. Leadership in medicine is not a title. It's a commitment to inspire, influence, and instill hope in the lives of those we, those we serve. So physician leadership, leadership is a crucial aspect of a doctor's career, and but we all recognize it is not typically emphasized or formally taught in medical schools. But as physicians progress in their careers, they often find themselves in leadership roles, whether as a department heads, team leaders, or administrators. Effective leadership becomes essential for driving positive change, improving patient outcomes, and fostering a collaborative healthcare environment. Recognizing the significance of physician leadership, there has been a growing acknowledgement to, of the need to incorporate the leadership training into the continuum of medical education. So with that in mind, today we embark on a journey to understand the profound impact of leaders within the medical profession. As the world faces unprecedented challenges, just like we had COVID, it is crucial to recognize the pivotal role that physicians play, not only in healthcare, but also as leaders shaping the course of our future. Physician leadership is a relentless, relentless pursuant of excellence, I would say. It is about being an advocate of change, a catalyst for innovation, and a voice for those who cannot speak for themselves. As Simon Sinek clearly says, leadership is not about being in charge. It is about taking care of those in your charge, okay? So that's a beautiful quote, and I want to embark on this journey. Let us embrace the responsibility to lead with purpose and conviction. So today, we come together to dwell into the fundamentals of physician leadership. These set of engaging sessions will equip you with the essential principles, qualities, and competencies required to excel as leaders within the medical field. Whether you are a seasoned professional seeking to refine your leadership skills or an aspiring leader ready to embark on a transformative journey, 
This platform is tailor-made for your growth. I can vouch for that. Our esteemed speakers are seasoned experts in the realm of physician leadership. They will share valuable insights drawn from real life experiences. They will also guide us through the intricacies of effective leadership, emphasizing the significance of empathy, collaboration, and resilience in driving positive outcomes in healthcare. So we really encourage all of you to actively participate, ask us questions, and share your interests during the session. So let us foster an environment of collaboration, knowledge sharing, for it is our collective endeavors that we can truly make a difference in the lives of our patients and medical community. So um, please join me in welcoming the speakers and congratulations each other for taking the first step in sharing, in shaping ourselves as transformative leaders. A few logistics before we dwell into this. So this leadership workshop series will have three sessions and these are the dates today, the first one and second is September 2nd and the third one is on September 30th. Those who attend all, all three sessions and respond to the evaluation questionnaire that, that we have posted on the chat section will receive a leadership certificate from Onka. So please post any questions you may have about this in the chat section. So now to the most exciting part, Please allow me to introduce our wonderful speakers. First speaker, we have Dr. Maria Nobre. She is a family doctor from Portugal, currently working in pediatric emergency department in Faro, and as a continuous improvement consultant at Kaizen Institute, helping clients to change for better through structured holistic approach that combines agile, digital, and lean tools. As an entrepreneur, she was co-founder and manager of three companies on healthcare sector, two focused on digital health and one on home care services. This is so impressive. She has been the European liaison officer of Aspire Global Leaders Program since 2018 and has promoted several workshops and meetings on leadership topic in both Wonka European and World Conferences. Interesting facts about Maria, I just want to share here. She dances hip hop with kids with half her age. <laughs> she enjoys, really, I can't believe this, she enjoys tandem skydive and hang gliding. Okay, kudos to you, Maria. She's a well-rounded physician leader, and we take pride to welcome you, Maria. We are very happy and honored to have you here. Next, moving on to our second speaker, Ms. Isra Khan. So, Isra is a professional coach and organizational development leader who partners with leaders, teams, and companies to make the right things easier to do. She is a natural connector and absolutely are gonna witness that. She has a beautiful gift of helping uncover our true vibrancy. And with just past few months working with her, I cannot agree more to that. So. She, is, she has spent 15 years guiding leaders to drive high performance and transformational change. She has spent seven years at Moffitt Cancer Center, developing leaders at all levels, and is especially passionate about creating programs that develop clinical leaders. Isra currently serves as the Director of Organizational Development at Yuma Regional Medical Center in Yuma, Arizona, United States. Her portfolio has expanded to including coaching and facilitation for the family medicine resident program, as well as with the medical directors across the hospital. Isra holds a bachelor degree in psychology and business from University of Minnesota Twin Cities and a master's degree in industrial organizational psychology from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. Few interesting facts. Isra lives in Southwest Arizona with her two dogs, and I'm really impressed with the names, Cope the Boxer and Ari the Lab. Um, outside of work, is, you can catch Isra performing her own music at local coffee shops. She also enjoys traveling and cooking outside on the grill, a point worth to be noted, Isra. So um, we are immensely grateful for the significant contribution um, with, with your expertise in organizing this webinar, Isra. Having you here, Isra, is an absolute honor and delight. Okay, moving on to our third speaker, last but not least, 
we have Dr. Sanka Ranendra Kumara. So Sanka is the Young Doctors Lead of Wonka, World Organization of Family Doctors. He is the Chief Family Physician of the group practice called the Family Health Clinic in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Sanka started his career as a medical office in charge of a rural hospital in Southern Sri Lanka, which was later transformed to an award-winning model primary care hospital by the team led by him. In recognition, he was appointed to the expert team compiled the World Bank Country Project, reorganizing primary health care in Sri Lanka as the junior most member. In addition to his contributions to Wonka, Sanka has led various leadership positions in Sri Lankan Medical Association and the College of General Practitioners of Sri Lanka. Sanka has delivered two orations, published several papers on international, international journals, and contributed to a few book chapters. In addition to family medicine and primary care, his research interests are in planetary health, lifestyle medicine, palliative care, and archaeology. Sanka has been a valuable pillar of support in this webinar series, serving as a role model for all of us to learn from. His approachability and prompt responses make me wonder if he ever sleeps. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you with us, Sanka. With, with us, beautiful introductions about our wonderful speakers. I would like to turn the platform to our first speaker, Maria. It's all yours, Maria. Thank you, Homa, for the lovely introduction. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar. So first of all, I would like to ask you, why are you here today? assisting a webinar on this leadership topic. What are your expectations for, for this webinar? You can write the answers in the chat or you can raise your hand to, to speak. Let me check who do we have here. No expectations so far. Okay, Purushottan. Hello. Uh, hello. Good evening here. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Dr. Purushottam. I'm a pediatrician in Bhutan. And uh, I can see my colleague Kille, who actually, uh, you know, prompted me to join this uh, Wonka meeting. I'm so excited. Uh, I, I'm afraid I'm not, I may not fall in the age group, but uh, I definitely thought that uh, it might make me feel younger, like a young doctor, like all of you. And I, I really look forward to learning. And in fact, uh, I think uh, 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 probably uh, maybe I would, uh, I was a little scared that I almost uh, finished my career or, or at least halfway through without uh, having any, uh, you know, uh, leadership or uh, manage managerial skills. So I kind of uh, uh, look forward to learning some of them and I guess it's not too late. So that's the, that's the whole reason I, I joined this meeting. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. It's never too late to learn. So, and age, it's a, a state of, of mind. So everyone is welcome in our, in our uh, webinar. So I'm just looking here in the chat, uh, people telling uh, to connect with an amazing team of inspiring colleagues. Thank you so much. And learn from each other about how to be a leader, to learn more about effective leadership, to strengthen my leadership skills, want to be a better effective leader, to learn regarding the leadership in these changing times and to connect with many leaders. So, thank you for, for sharing your, your, um, your expectations. Some of the topics we will definitely cover during uh, our sessions, if not today in the part two uh, and three of our series. So, um, hopefully, hopefully by the end of the three sessions, all your doubts are, are answered and you feel more confident on your leadership roles, um, the formal and the informal ones. So there are several leadership roles that doctors can assume throughout their careers, starting with student associations up to high management positions. What I didn't expect was the daily leadership associated with our job. I still remember the first time that a nurse called me as doctor in the emergency department uh, because they needed my help. And I didn't even look at her 
because that doctor was not for me. I was not used to be called by that title and I didn't recognize it as to myself. So was I prepared to assume the leadership in that situation? No, I was not. Did I know how to treat that patient? In theory, yes, I did. But I was not confident to assume the coordination of that team to face that crisis. So at that moment, I realized expectations were on me and I did not feel prepared to, to live for those expectations. We know that the research regarding leadership in healthcare is just beginning. And this increased focus was due to the raising numbers of burnout, unfortunately, and the COVID crisis, where the need to assume not only the clinical care, but also the narrative uh, to educate our patients and, and population to be influencers. Um, so our leadership role was uh, forced uh, and to and cha and change in these in dif difficult times. What literature showed us is that physicians are interested in those leadership roles, but formal training and development programs are still lacking in, in our curricula. And that's why we are here today. And uh, hopefully that's what we, we help you to, to understand and to navigate throughout our, our webinar. <clears throat> so let's uh, move on. Doctors are usually on a leadership role, and this is despite their experience or relationship with the team. Historically, it is related with the differentiation and specialization of skills and the greater knowledge and higher status. But most recently, we noticed that this hierarchy still happens, but now is more related with responsibility and accountability. What we all feel is that on, all eyes are on us. People expect from doctors to be the role model, to be the example to follow. And that puts a great pressure on every doctor since the first day of our residency, whether we like it or not, whether we want it or not, whether we, we signed for it or not. And in primary care, one of our most important features is the proximity that we have to our patients and the community, as well as with our teams that are usually smaller, especially when we are comparing to, to hospitals. And here, the hierarchy may be less strict or high, um, and it is common to have a young doctor leading a more experienced healthcare professionals that are not physicians. So, how do you feel about this? Were you confident to assume that role like the first time you had to? Does anyone would like to share your thoughts from the audience? Bruni, you can go ahead. Hi, yeah, so I had an experience earlier this week when I got called out by one of my senior doctors who were in charge, who was in charge of the clinic I work at, because I did not let him know that one of the doctors on my shift did not show up to work that day, and I felt a bit... I guess, um, conflicted because to me, this doctor who didn't show up not only was older than me, but all, also that they were a physician before I myself became a physician. But in that moment, you know, my senior doctor told me that I am still in a way supposed to jump and take a leadership role and I guess, um, I guess speak to the colleague who didn't show up because... I am officially trained in family medicine, just recently finished the program. And yeah, it was a difficult situation for me to grasp, thinking that even though I am a young family doctor, how do I go and approach someone who has more experience than me and I guess um, speak about them, speak to them about it ethically? Thank you. Thank you for sharing your, your story. This is 
something that probably we all felt we we have all experienced the moments where we were not confident enough when, to to be the leaders that we we want to be um but that we don't feel that confidence or the training enough to to be that that person is there any medical students in the audience that would like to to share how do you expect to be your first day as as doctor if you do you believe you you will be prepared to assume all this this leadership roles that we are talking about So I'm seeing here in the, the, the chat, Marlene Kalisht is writing, the first time I assumed a leadership position, I started my work with huge joy, but soon found myself drowned with administrative tasks and that are not related at all with, with medicine. Uma, uh, Mona, you can speak, please. Sure, thank you. I am not a medical student. I haven't been a medical student for over two decades. But I just wanted to recognize um, kind of um, some of the barriers we face. Uh, I'm, I'm based in Canada. So some of the barriers we might face based on our gender or, you know, uh, certain ethnic backgrounds, we may feel competent um, to possibly rise to the occasion, but second guess ourselves because of these kind of conditions that have been put on us through society as we're trying to navigate our way through. Um, I am a, I am, you know, I'm a person of color, I'm female, I am cisgendered, but still, you know, um, there are those limits. And I think it's very important to support aspiring leaders on how to navigate some of that because it's so systemic in so many parts of our world. Um, and I'm really, really excited to be here today because I really want to learn the approach from all of you because you're you're kind of navigating similar situations, um, similar issues, but in different areas. I'm really curious to to kind of learn from you and kind of see what has worked and what might need improvement. So um, I just wanted to point that out, especially if we have young learners um, or, or people who are earlier on in their careers, not necessarily young, because like you said, Maria, it's an age, it's a frame of mind, but earlier in their careers and kind of support them with the tools to advocate for them um, as they try to advocate for themselves and patients and, and their peers. Thank you so much, Mula. And thank you everyone for sharing your, your thoughts. It's important for all of us to understand that we are not alone in this in this struggle in in this looking for um, some some training some development program and that exact that is exactly why we are doing this this webinar series today. So I now pass the word to to Isram. Thank you, Maria. Hi, everybody. Greetings. So I am loving all the thoughts that have been and perspectives that have been shared here today so far. Um, and you are all on the right track um, in terms of, you know, thinking about how do you how do you approach these sort of like difficult situations? For example, we had someone share that, you know, there was an expectation that they had to speak up to someone that was more seasoned uh, than them. Um, you know, how do you approach these these situations? We've had some um, people just now talk about like it is really hard you have one expectation when you're jumping into the role of a doctor which is required years of training um, only to find out that there is a massive uh, um, gap in a skill set where it's like wow like am i crazy um you're not uh, you are definitely not alone um, so just a really quick overview of what i'm going to be going through with you for our time together today so I'm going to be providing you with very practical tools, okay? It's one thing to talk about the need for physician leaders. Yes, it's important. We are all in agreement with that. But it really is, how do I take the first step? Especially if you are in a, in a situation right now where it's like, you don't know what to do, given some of the uh, experiences that you've shared, some even as recent as this past week. So my... 
piece here is to provide you with practical tools that you can start putting into a little toolbox, right? A, a, in a, a fictitious toolbox, and you can pull them out and start practicing them. Um, and these practical tools are based on um, behavioral science as well as other research studies in organizational psychology. I've had a lot of years being a professional coach um, managing leadership development programs and team development, specifically in healthcare. I am beyond passionate about leadership development within healthcare. And I think it might be because I come from a family of physicians. <laughs> I'm not a physician myself, but my parents are physicians. My grandfather was physician. My uncles are physicians. So I think, uh, I think it runs in my blood. So before we move on, um, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Um, so let's dive in. So at this point, based off of my experience and my research, what I have found is that the best leaders, just in general, it doesn't have to be in healthcare, but the best leaders in general possess very specific qualities. And I'll, I'll run through them right now. So the best leaders at the very beginning, before they do anything else, they have an internal belief that leadership development is very critical to their success. They must have the belief first before they start doing anything else. They must fully believe that leadership and developing themselves is a critical competency. What this basically means is demonstrating a personal commitment, a personal and honest commitment to understanding and accepting that whether I like it or not, I'm in a leadership role and making that commitment to develop yourself. And if you're here for this webinar, this is part of a reflecting of that commitment, okay? The next thing is that the best leaders are very aware of themselves, so aware that they are developing this comfort with not having all the answers at once. We're gonna talk about this in a little bit more detail later. The third piece is the best leaders are able to self-regulate their own emotions. So much so that they're so good at it that they come to a point where they are challenging their own assumptions. So for example, did I overreact, right? Um, am I assuming something about someone else and I'm feeling reactive and I want to um, just react instead of respond? Those are things that are part of self-regulation. And to be honest, it really is the heart of development is to be able to manage and adapt to changing situations. Next is the best leaders are very, very in tune. They are emotionally in tune with how others show up around them, right? Uh, and this is not only reflection, but it's also empathy, okay? The empathy is not only for our patients, but also with the team that we work alongside. Last, but certainly last, not least, the best leaders are able to manage their own relationships with the utmost of compassion and respect. So all of these things, if you put them all together in like one little box, that box is called emotional intelligence, okay? So the best leaders practice emotional intelligence. What that basically means is that it's not just the IQ, right? IQ is the intelligence quotient, so cognitive ability, things of that nature. But you have emotional intelligence, which is called EQ or EQI. And this was developed by a researcher called Daniel Goldman. Daniel Goldman, excellent book. He's the founding father of emotional intelligence. So these are the best leaders. But I found something in my experience that's even more important for physician leaders. So the best physician leaders practice emotional intelligence, but there is one extra ingredient that especially for physician leaders, they have to practice. So it's not only practicing emotional intelligence, but physician leaders need to recognize their own limits. What do I mean by that? Basically, physician leaders need to embrace the fact that they will not have all the answers all the time, 
Now, coming from a family of physicians and clinicians and working alongside cl clinicians for the better part of my career, I know very well that all of you are very high achievers. You want to be the best. You want to pass that exam. You want to pass the, the, the hundreds of exams that you take. You know exactly what to do because your profession calls you to do it, to make swift decisions very quickly because it is almost a matter of life and death for many of us, right? But if you are high achievers, you must understand that not everybody around you is going to be the same as you. Not everybody is going to live up to the expectations that you have of yourself, okay? Your team and the people that you work beside carry diverse knowledge and skills in order for you all to solve problems much quicker than you would alone. So to summarize, the best physician leaders practice emotional intelligence and they are able to recognize, I don't know what to do right now, or maybe jumping into this problem really quickly and trying to solve it myself will not yield the best outcome. Maybe I need to discuss it with other people, make a more reasoned decision as opposed to trying to figure it out on your own. You are not alone. You are trained to figure out things on your own. But in this space and in this evolving healthcare landscape, we must understand that we are not alone. Okay, so those are the pieces of the best physician leaders. Now, how do you actually do this, right? I'm all about being very practical. How do you do this? Well, the most important thing that you need to do if you are looking to dive into crafting yourself as a good physician leader, whether you're a resident, a med student, whatever, to prepare you, there is a very important thing that you have to do first. And that is you have to change your paradigm. You have to shift the way that you think. And the reason why this is so important is because I have personally coached several clinicians that were amazing at what they did. Researchers, oncologists, primary care, emergency medicine, surgeons, all of them are excellent at what they did. And then they, when they got into formal leadership positions like director, medical director, chief, um, head of department, they suddenly experienced an identity crisis. Am I a clinician? Am I a leader? I am trained to be a clinician. So I'll try to figure out how to lead when I get to it. Right now I'm really busy. Those leaders end up failing or end up struggling quite a bit. When you are in a leadership position and when you accept the fact that you are, just by way of being a physician, mindset is the success factor. And when you change your mindset, it will actually challenge much of your years of training. So you have to be able to balance both. Now, I want to prove my point by actually giving you a very short quiz. This is a knowledge quiz. This is going to test your knowledge, okay? So I want you all to type your answers in the chat. Are we ready? Tap your answers in the chat. The first question on this quiz. What are the three bones of the human arm called? Type it in the chat. <laughs> it, okay, I believe you. That, that's, that's probably in Portuguese. Humorous, radius, and ulna. I think that's right. Right, uh, uh, my, my fellow, okay, good. Yes, okay, excellent. Very good, you, you all did that really quickly, right? Because you were, you're trained. All right, next question. Dyspepsia is also known as what? Gord, is that, is that right? Yes, okay. I thought it was indigestion. Are they the same thing? Yeah, okay. 
<laughs> All right. I, okay. Excellent. Okay. Two out of two. Okay. Here's the third one. Ready? What are the fourth components of emotional intelligence? I don't see a lot of people. <laughs> Excellent. Linda, I love that you said, I don't know. That's amazing. Okay, I see some people trying. All right, excellent, very good. So this is really important. Yeah, I know. I know people. People are trying. I'm going to show you what the what the four components of emotional intelligence are. But here's the thing: think about how quickly you answered the first two questions. Everybody, right? Radius, humorous, ulna, gourd, indigestion, reflex, all the things, right? But when it's like four components of emotional intelligence, it's like, I really don't know what that is. So a few points to make here. Number one, it's okay if you don't know it. Number two, if you said, I don't know in the chat, I want to applaud you because that's really good. All right. You don't know, you don't know. Number three, we are going to start learning about emotional intelligence right now. And I want you to understand that it's going to be hard because you are essentially starting from the ground up, I'm going to be providing you with the absolute foundations today to build off of. And if it feels hard, if it feels uncomfortable for you, that's okay. You're starting to learn. All right. Thank you for playing that small game. Okay. So let's go into emotional intelligence. Here are the four components. So I'm going to orient you to this two by two matrix here. So if you look at the screen, the top half is all about awareness, awareness of self and awareness of others. The bottom half is all about management, managing yourself and managing your relationships. Okay, so let's start at the top half on the left hand side, self awareness. Like I said before, in the um, previous slide self awareness is probably the first thing that you can begin doing starting today to build your emotional intelligence and eventually get to a higher quality level of leadership. Self-awareness basically means you are being mindful. You are checking in with yourself depending on your situation. So for example, right now, do a really quick check-in. How are you feeling? Are you feeling excited? Are you feeling nervous? Are you feeling creative? Are you feeling bored? You know, what are those things? Do a quick check-in of yourself. I like to call this with my clients. I like to say you are checking your own emotional vital signs. Okay. So you check your temperature, you check your blood pressure, you check all, what are your other vital signs in terms of your emotions, right? How are you feeling? That's the first thing. Just check in with yourself, especially during times of stress. What are your physical triggers when you feel stressed or when you feel like, you know, you're, you're, you're starting to get busy, right? Does your head ache? Does your heart go faster? Really check in with yourself. That is the first step. You don't have to do anything. Just pay attention. So that's number one. Number two, let's go to the right-hand side, social awareness. Social awareness is being aware of other people around you, just paying attention. What skill does that entail? That means that you're being very present. It's very difficult to be present when you are rushing or when you are in a hurry, okay? Now, for all of those high achievers in the room, right? Next patient, next patient, next thing, next thing, next thing, right? Put it in the chart right? Get interrupted. And it's like, oh my goodness, that is going to be a barrier for you being present. Okay. When you're able to be present, you're able to pick up on other people's emotion. You're able to really exercise the core skill of empathy. Um, social awareness basically means that you're curious about other people. You express concern for other people. And in the sense of leadership, you're able to watch and pick up on other people's strengths. You are able to see what are people good at so that I can leverage their strengths because they're compliments to mine. So that's social awareness. Next, 
Let's go down on the second half. Let's talk about self-management. So if you're aware of yourself, you have to manage yourself and regulate yourself. For this, basically, in other words, this is to control your impulse, okay? So think about a time, like if you're getting an email, if you get a text, if you get a phone call, and it's like you want to respond right away because you feel a certain way. You feel angry, frustrated, impatient, whatever, and you respond right away. That's not self-management, right? Self-management is just taking some time, being adaptable to situations, and asking yourself the question, what do I really want out of this situation? What do I truly want? Do I want to really take care of the patient? Do I want to start arguing, right? What is it that you really want? And then finally, relationship management. This is all about communication, connection, navigating conflict, and also navigating being part of a team. Research actually suggests that medical training in medical school is such an individualistic concept because you're really focused on um, coming up and being confident in your own clinical practice. It's a very individualistic um, way of thinking. And then suddenly when you are part of a team, again, it starts clashing against your years of training. So it may feel difficult in the beginning, but just understand that relationship management is the key to um, leadership development as it relates to the team. So I've gone through the four components of emotional intelligence. Again, this is the foundation. So let's talk about, okay, what are some common challenges that will force us to evaluate our emotional intelligence? So again, I'm all about making this practical. So the common challenges, like I said before, as physicians, we are absolutely trained to make decisions reflexively especially in acute situations and emergency situations. That is the excellent skill set to have. We are also rarely stumped, right? We are expected, as Maria said, to have the answers, to be the role model, to do all the things. But when it comes to very complex situations involving people and your team and leadership, you have to make more reasoned decisions. And sometimes, with our clinical expertise, we think our clinical expertise is going to solve the issue, but actually we tend to overestimate the need to make more reasoned decisions, right? So here is a really, really common example. And I am going to ask Sanka to actually share um, a story that he had that highlights this challenge. And it has to do with navigating issues between patients and staff members. Sanka. Yeah, thank you, Isha. So, yes, as you told, uh, the main problem probably we have as physicians is we have some sort of a dilemma because are we physicians or are we leaders? Actually, we, are, we, are, we, are, we have to be physician leaders. But the problem is, as Isha told, uh, we have been trained to be physicians mainly. So we work promptly. We take decisions promptly and reflexively. So that's a problem in most of the problem. Most of the that's a problem in most of the situations where we where we face difficulty and challenge, a real challenge. Let's take a, a take an example. Like uh, this is a very 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 common example. Probably, uh, let's take a complaint made by your patients against one of your trustworthy and very close staff members. So how would you behave in this situation? This is not a situation to take a reflexive decision, right? This is not a, because usually you would either take patient side, provided that we are, uh, we, are, we, are, we are bound to serve the patients. Also, you would say, you would be on the other side, yeah? you would say, okay, this, something like this would never happen in my practice. So this should be wrong. So if you take either sides and reflexively respond to that incident, there would be a big, big communication gap and there would be a big problem, trouble, and either sides would not be happy. 
so i think this is one of the very very important uh, say incidents where we can practice empathy right when we were talking about emotional intelligence empathy is of course included into that i saw some of you have typed that as well of course it's it's a part but it's included in those four uh, main uh, main points inside the emotional intelligence or main parts of the emotional intelligence so in a situation like this are we going to be emotional no we are not going to be emotional right we are going to be real leaders which means we are going to discuss this in a different way we we would have differently act i mean we would have acted like real leaders where you get down everyone and we would discuss there could be some misunderstandings so would be resolve this problem in a better way so the bottom line is in an incident like this even uh, uh, where you know a conflict between a patient and a staff member you should not promptly respond and uh, you should always have to remind this is not a situation of a patient you have to respond quickly you know as an emergency situation so one important thing about this is this is about all about conflict resolution so we are going to talk about conflict resolution in the next webinar so i think stay tuned about that so i can i think uh, isra you can talk about the next point from this point onwards yeah yes thank you um sankha so uh based off of what sankha shared right th these are going to be things that come up and when they come up what i what we would hope for you to do is to think about us talking about this right it's like oh i went to this webinar and they said that this was going to happen and it's happening how do i deal with it right so when this comes up um and if it hasn't already it probably will you could probably assume that it'll happen because it is so common and it again it goes back to this piece of self awareness right that that's the first thing this this issue came up between a patient and a staff member it's, okay how am i feeling i'm feeling worried i'm feeling concerned i'm feeling frustrated i'm feeling confused just label the emotion and just say okay now how am i going to do this I saw somebody in the chat that says listen listen to every side of the story first and then make a judgment. That's an excellent first step. The piece here is to when you do listen to all sides of the story is how are you listening? Are you listening to understand or are you listening to respond? Are you listening to react? Are you listening to judge? There are different levels of listening. So when you do sit down with either side in a conflict, you'll want to pay attention to that. and that's all i'm going to say about conflict because again i don't want to give too much away from our from our second session okay so let's go straight into some additional tips for practice so these are two things that you can do today okay today actually like right now um so the first thing is to start asking yourself how often in your medical practice do you say i don't no i don't know okay i this is your homework okay how often do you say i don't know and how does it feel when you say i don't know all right now it, this is related to to when you're at work your clinical practice your medical practice how does it feel when you say i don't know if it feels okay that's great get into the habit of saying that because that is a really good practice for um that essential ingredient in physician leadership the other thing is how do you handle your everyday annoyances at work in your practice that's the second piece of homework that i'd like for you to try and practice i want you to identify in your mind the things that really really annoy you that that make you roll your eyes in your clinical practice how do you handle them so for example um maybe it's oh i get so annoyed when i get phone calls at 2 o'clock in the morning from the nurse and it's just a completely like dumb question and i don't like th those are that's something that could be an annoying one the second one could be when does it get challenging you know are there certain um types of patients questions that i find challenging that 
you know, kind of like make my blood boil. What are those things? Start identifying them and start identifying how you handle them. Okay. Now to give you some help on how to identify some of these, we're going to walk you through some very practical and common examples of everyday annoyances that our um, fellow um, family physicians on the call today have and want to share with you. And so again, you're not alone. So be thinking about each of these examples and come up with your own because that's going to help you with your homework. Okay. So here's the first one, Sanka. Um, your example of the annoyance was the reluctance to consult or refer medicinal formularies. And we have this lovely image of BNF. Um, Sanka, please go ahead and, and share. Yeah, Isra, uh, before that, I would like to read one of the comments by Tika. Uh, it's, uh, he says, we yeah. are experts. Patients come for an answer. How can we say, I don't know, right? Okay, this is one of the main problems we have. I totally agree with you, but you are not alone. Okay, good. We also have, we also have experienced the same thing, but I will tell how to tell, how, I don't, how to tell, I don't yes. know. Yes, um, excellent. I, I think this has something to do with your confidence and your experience and probably the maturity as well. To be mature, you shouldn't go, I mean, you shouldn't be old or elderly, right? This is a way of being mature. I mean, listening to other colleagues' experience. So this is one of the incidents I, I just want to tell you. When I was, when I started my medical practice as a very junior doctor, probably say eight years back, uh, when a patient comes to me and you know each and every medicine is not in our mind and also each and every drug interaction is not in our mind and sometimes brands are also not memorized, say a, 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 a drug that is used rarely. So when I wanted to prescribe something that I cannot remember, what I used to do those days was I go to another room in the practice and look into the BNF. BNF is the British National Formulary. I know that this is what used in Sri Lanka uh, commonly, uh, but I know your own countries would have one formularies, medicinal formularies. So I go to another room, right? Telling something, some other reason. And, you know, I look into the BNF and then I come back and, you know, proudly prescribe the medicine. But now, being an experienced person and being confident in what I'm doing now, right? Now I do it in front of the patient. I take the BNF and I look into that and never the patients have thought bad about it. And I also, you know, I also tell them, okay, I went through and there's no problem at all or say no interaction at all with these two medicines or say, okay, this is the best medicine now. Okay, I got some, you know, very effective brand for you. So something like that. So it's like sort of a, you know, shared decision making as well. And patient feels comfortable and probably more confident because they know that I am just, just not uh, prescribing something which is in my mind probably, which would be, you know, uh, not real or not correct. But I, I refer to something and they have confidence in me. That, and, you know, as family doctors, especially, we have a we have very good doctor-patient relationship where patients always depend on us. Also, they, they have that, that, that relationship is as such where they really, really trust you. So looking into the BNF is nothing there, right? So this is, that's why I told when I was in my early career, I was doing like that. But now as a con more confident person, I, I do a different. So now I say, I don't know. I will look into the BNF. So this is, one, I think, one very good example. And yeah, the second one is from, is from. So yeah, you're going to probably tell about the second second example. Uh, I think yes. Uma is going to share. Yes, her. Uma. Uma yeah. has a great example. Um, and this example is, you know, how do you make decisions? Uh, for patients who are breastfeeding and the, who are asking about the medication interactions. Uma, feel free to share your story. 
Absolutely, Sra. Uh, thank you for that. So I just want to start with this little thing that I wanted to, I experienced when I was training in US, like, you know, when we start as medical students, our white coat is very small, like it goes up until the, you know, just above your knee. And then when you become an, a resident, like a trainee doctor, it becomes a little longer. And then when you are an attending, the coat is really long with long sleeves and you look so elegant. So my understanding is if the coat is longer, you're supposed to know everything. That's my understanding when I started my medical career. So during early stages of my career, so when patients inquired about the safety of some specific medications, especially when they're breastfeeding, I used to feel really hesitant uh, to admit my lack, lack of knowledge in there because it's freshman out of the training. I didn't have answers for all the interactions between medications and breastfeeding. So I would discreetly refer to the, you know, like a reliable point of uh, care medical resource, like up to date or something. So as my experience grew, I came to appreciate that the value of transparency in healthcare interactions is very important. So nowadays, when faced with similar questions, I really approach the situation with complete openness. Um, if I'm not familiar with the medication's uh, suitability for breastfeeding, I candidly admit my lack of expertise in that area. However, I do so like while reassuring the patient um, about their well-being is my top priority, and I'm committed to finding the most accurate information for them. That's the way I approach this. By uh, involving the patient in the process, I feel like, you know, researching the repu reputable sources together. And this collaborative approach makes me feel like the, it only not only fosters the trust, but also strengthens uh, the patient provider relationship. So saying I don't know doesn't mean that you're leaving the patient helpless, but we are trying to approach it by, you know, involving them together and finding the answers together. So patients really appreciate knowing that their concerns are, you know, acknowledged and addressed um, with utmost care and diligence. That's what I feel. So through transparency and patient-centered approach, I think we can still, um, you know, instill that confidence and assurance in those we serve, um, probably promoting a deeper sense of partnership in their health journey. So that's my experience with, you know, changing my I don't know to making a, a you know, transparent relationship. So thank you. Thank you, Omar. That's excellent. Okay, good. So uh, Maria, Maria has a very interesting example, and I think a lot of us may relate to it. So here's her example. It is when we have to deal with patients personal beliefs on treatment options. Go ahead, Maria. Thank you. So it happens to me quite often uh, nowadays that patients come asking for my help. And after uh, the entire consultation, when I'm prescribing a, a treatment, they would just say to me like, no, 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 I don't believe in, in medicine or in medication. I don't want to take any pills. And I remember the first time that this happened to me, I felt like, really crazy like what is happening this person came to my office asking for my help and now what what do they want like a miracle no one taught me how to do miracles in med school so and it, it really frustrated me in the first time that this happened and but the situation kept kept happening so what i realized is that i need to learn to acknowledge this frustration that I that I have regarding the situation with with the patients, to address this situation uh, in a way that I don't that I keep uh, the trust and the, the confidence and the relationship that I have with my patients. So what I started to do is to explain to them that that's what I learned in med school. I learned how to diagnose and to to treat with with medication, and that is my proposal. But the, the final decision is there. So they have the decision to look for a second opinion or another opinion. And I cannot uh, say that I agree or disagree with something that I don't know about. When people ask me about natural um, plants and, and other things that if I've never studied about them, I cannot give a, a, an opinion. So what now what I do is that I acknowledge that this really frustrates me and I explain to exactly that to the patients 
and let them have the final decision. They have the final call. But no, yeah, no one taught me how to do miracles in med school. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, and, you know, I just want to say that what, while we were designing this, this part of the, of the webinar, I wanted to commend every single person on the team to actually share, like, look, th this, is, this is what frustrates me. This is what annoys me, right? It's like, I'm not a miracle worker. The, the ability to actually kind of express yourself and express the fact that there are some situations where I have to regulate my own emotions because if I didn't, you know, it wouldn't be a very uh, positive outcome. And just recognizing that again is the first step. It's that awareness piece. Okay. So the fourth piece, and I think this is, this is, um, I've, I'm, I'm able to see this in my own job. I mean, I don't care for patients, but I, I see this happening all the time. And this last one is, almost universal, where we have frustrations with our team. We have frustrations with our care team. Uh, for example, scheduling, right? Scheduling your calendar, anything that has to do with time, how many patients you're seeing, et cetera. Maria, do you have anything uh, additional to share on this perspective? Yes, I remember when, when Natalia was sharing her, her example with us and we were talking about this and especially I think this happens in smaller communities or especially in, in primary healthcare that we, we know our patients, but we also know our, our teams for, for a long time. And our teams know the community. So sometimes they, they expect like an extra attention for that fam, family um, uh, person, for that friend, because people know each other and we have rules for a reason. And every time that we want to, yeah, I know it's just an extra, but if we, we, we have exceptions for all the people that we know, all the people that we care in our communities, everyone in our, in our clinics, our time wouldn't be enough. So it, it's difficult to, to manage uh, the scheduling and all the, the, the exceptions that we want to, to give to the people that we, we know the family, we know their story, we have a re relationship with them. Thank you, Maria. Um, Sanka. No, very interesting point uh, came out in the chat. That's uh, why I want to sort of, you know, I, I would say convey it to everyone. Uh, one is like, as family doctors and even any doctor, um, we have, as I told, very strong doctor-patient relationship. So. Patients don't expect always us to know everything, right? They want their doctors to be best for them. And uh, they want sometimes just to listen to their problems. Not even they want any answers. I mean, usually it's like we are there to find them the best uh, solutions, best answers. So we shouldn't know everything. We can find it uh, out, right, from internet or a book or whatever it is from a colleague. But sometimes, not only that they don't need, uh, I mean, they are not expecting us to know everything, but also they don't want the answers at all. They just want us to listen to them. So I think uh, that is a very good point here, as very, uh, especially as family doctors. Go ahead. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the team, do you have any other um, additions, Oma? Do you have anything else to add? I think we covered the I don't know part and what, what you are nice, your part. I just wanted to share this quick example on what yeah. really, um, you know, um, you know, stirs my inside out is the question of like when patients come and ask about weight loss medications, I always have this, um, you know, um, put in a difficult situation and patients think that, you know, weight loss can be achieved by just one magic pill and they don't need to follow diet. They don't need to do exercise, but just give me the injection that is not even FDA approved to take the injection and let me get the weight loss. So initially that was really like, I should say, kind of was an annoying for me when they ask, um, but then, you know, the handling of the situation turned around because there were so many requests like that so I, I went into that and understand 
it's just a lack of ignorance on how the whole process happens. So it's just, you know, it takes that little effort from the physician side to sit down and explain what the pros and cons of these medications and how they should handle this and what are the long-term side effects. So if you could take that time and explain it to them, it makes a little sense to them and they try to work around you because if you can just say, okay, you do this for three months, if it doesn't happen, then we take the step B. So it's kind of work in progress with them. It's hand in hand, you know, holding the hand and walking together kind of a situation so from getting annoyed annoyed with that question to turning into like you know again you know, walking together kind of a practice really helped me to handle the situation better so yes it does happen almost every single day at where I practice yes thank yeah. you yeah thanks for sharing that <clears throat> the other thing that I will say before we move on is you know, these, these are your tips for practicing. And so um, th these are the pieces where, you know, you can, you can absolutely start this today. And right now, my recommendation to you is don't try to solve anything. Again, go slow, right? What we're doing this from the, from the ground up, you don't have to be an expert in leadership right after this webinar, right? Just, just you know, pace yourself. And we're here to help you. Um, as we move along into this webinar series, because again, this is the foundation. And for some of us, you know, this might feel kind of strange at the beginning, like, God, why do I have to like, you know, think about my feelings all the time? You know, that's just not part of my personality. I'm, I'm, I'm very different. That's okay. We're not prescribing this in a specific way. You need to figure out your own style of leadership. You need to discover and explore what is it that kind of works for you? Um, we all can be really, really effective leaders in our own unique ways. So you need to find out what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses and find a way to leverage your strengths so that you don't have to worry about the things that you feel not very strong in, okay? So again, this is your homework. Um, how often do you say, I don't know, and how do you handle your everyday annoyances in your medical practice? The more that you practice this and the more that you try this out and you practice the foundation, it is going to lead to the actual growth areas where leadership is going to um, come out. So for example, communication, right? How do you speak effectively so that your message is being received in a way that has everybody's best interests at heart? How do you collaborate? You know, again, when we are trained in medicine, it is a very individualistic profession. How do you manage team dynamics? How do you manage conflict? How do you make decisions that are more strategic as opposed to, you know, kind of like a band-aid solution? How do you figure those out? We are going to touch on all of these things in the next session where our next session is going to involve how do you resolve conflict? How do you flex your style and adapt uh, your leadership style based off of dis different um, situations? And then lastly, how do you motivate your teams? Um, so again, practice the pieces of emotional intelligence and we would love, absolutely love to have you at our next session on September 2nd, where we're gonna go to part two and build off of what we've already uh, covered. So at this point, we are officially done with our content. Um, I think we could be, you know, open to take some some questions if people have stuff in the chat, um, on the spot advice <laughs> if you need it. Um, but other than that, um, Oma, I'll hand it over to you and um, see if there are any questions. We do have a little bit of time left here. Sure, Isra, thank you for that. So we can take five to 10 minutes. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to either put it in the chat box so one of us can read it out for you or you can also raise your hand in the chat section. I mean, raise your hand and ask us a question directly. Um, one of us will be happy to answer your questions. Or if you want to just share your thoughts, please feel free to. So those who are all um, stepping out because of the time. So I just want to give a quick reminder. We have the 
um, survey link um, to assess the uh, webinar. Um, so if you could please fill that for us, that will be wonderful. Um, Kinley will be posting the survey for, for you in the chat section. So please feel free to um, do that for us. And also we have the next session on September 2nd, uh, which will be the continuity as Israel was saying, we are gonna have some uh, in-depth into the physician leadership. Um, this is again the same time UTC 1 p.m. on September 2nd. So I didn't see much questions here. So I just want to move forward with concluding this webinar. Um, again, we genuinely hope that you have acquired the solid foundation in physician leadership concepts and practices. Um, so I would we, we all warmly invite you um, to join us for the next session on the September 2nd. Um, again, as I said before, by attending both, all three sessions, you will be eligible to receive a completion certificate from Onka. Um, so again, the survey links are posted in the chat section. We will try to post it one more time before you leave. So should you have any questions or need further assistance, please do not hesitate to contact one of us. Um, so we are eagerly looking forward to see you all in the next session, um, where we'll be hosting an esteemed panel of established uh, physician leaders who will deliver insightful um, you know, talks and as Isra was saying, our topic is uh, next topic is effective leadership practices. So I really thank you all for being a part of this wonderful learning experience, and uh, it's been great to welcome you again. Thank you all. And I thank see you, Oma. Yeah, there are a couple of yeah, questions I, here. Uh, do we have any material to read and prepare for the next session? No, um, just come with an open mind and uh, just with an intention to learn. Um, you don't need to, don't be a high achiever. You, you're you fine, just don't, you don't need to prepare. <laughs> There's also a second question on how should we register for the second session? You have already um, been, you have already registered now. You can use the same link and attend the session. So it's about, uh, like, uh, you can select probably, if you have selected all three all three uh, sessions, you should uh, receive another uh, registration link. Uh, we will anyway, uh, as uh, as as the participants of this session, we will reach uh, out to you again. We will also be sending you a post session. Uh, yes, a post session feedback form. Um, we will be um, sharing that with you. I don't believe we, do we have it now or are we going yeah, to email yes. it later? Yeah, we have uh, two things. One there we go. Pre-survey pre is exactly this one. Uh, Pre-survey is a different one. It's about your mm -hmm. uh, practices and knowledge. But this is about this session per se. I mean, about this yep. singular session, where how we have uh, probably achieved our targets. Just give a open-minded feedback. Uh, so it's about that. But then we would have a post-session survey after all three webinars about your practices and knowledge. So that's different. This is about this webinar only, the post-session post uh, assessment. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, uh, Maria, Estra, and Sanka for making this evening so beautiful. Um, you gave, I, I'm sure the audience were, you know, excited to learn more from you today and thank you all for your time and thank you everyone for participating today. I really look forward to see you all again in September. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.